like everything's on the internet or you could go to classes like online Ableton classes or online music production classes as like a nine-year-old and ten-year-old and produce your own stuff and imagine like releasing your stuff at that young age or it's not even about the success but kind of figuring your sound out like from a young age that saves so much time. All right, Jill Lynn, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's definitely an honor to join your podcast and I'm excited. Yeah, thank you. So for listeners that may not be familiar with your music yet, why don't you tell a little bit about your background so people can get a little bit more familiar? So I'm a crossover pianist that makes progressive piano music. And um, it's more of a progressive rock fusion and progressive jazz fusion piano music. Awesome. And you're on tour right now. Where are you at currently? Yeah, I'm currently in an Asia tour um, since last year. And currently I'm visiting family in Malaysia. Awesome. Where are you actually based out of? Um, I changed my basis. I, I'm basically based out of like, depending on where I perform, um, or depending on where I'm currently touring at. So it changes, but we're about to move our base, um, this year. Although we're not entirely sure exactly where our basis, um, will be at, but, uh, I'm currently looking at Los Angeles, back to Los Angeles after yeah. the tour. Because it's way easier after wrapping up the Asia tour to uh, head back to LA, focus on the European tour um, and North America tour right after our new album this year. So hopefully um, that works out. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so let's dive into being a crossover artist because um, you're classically trained in piano. and. Yeah. How, where did the crossover start for you? Have you just always been into other genres of music and just, I, I, I've seen some of your other interviews. So it sounds like the classical just didn't completely resonate with you. Um, yeah, that's true. But actually that's because when I was young, I, I didn't really say I would resonate with classical music. Um, when I was young, I remember listening to like Vanessa May stuff, um, Havasi, David Foster and Maxim stuff on piano, and they were all crossover artists. So I think that honestly got me to have such a crazy, desperate passion <laughs> almost, um, to get into the crossover career, but I think it's because of the resources that I have at that time and the only options available. Like I was told that going to the classical world after college um, was the best thing to do, or I would say like the only thing to do. So I basically believed in that. I mean, you know, you're young and you just wanted everything to work out, especially when you're desperate to make your career work. So, yeah. um, yeah, so that's how I accidentally went into the pure classical loophole. And then the funny thing was, I remember during my conservatory years where it's just like, oh, you need to finish memorizing an etude in like a week and stuff like that. And then like when your classical techniques are not there, because I play like really contemporary um, I play my classical pieces really contemporary and I remember like professors having a hard time changing that, like changing my style because that's just me. Like, I think I was born to play crossover music and like contemporary music. So they were having a really hard time and I was having a hard time keeping up. But it's funny because I remember the only class that no one could ever uh, beat me to in grades was the contemporary improvising class, like in, in that conservatory. And I would always get like an A plus <laughs> because like I could do that on the spot. And you know, like when you have classical musicians, like pure classical musicians, they would need a score and to read out from sheet music like all the time. So for me, it was just like, no, I don't need a score. Like just give me two chords or something. You know, <laughs> it was really funny. But yeah, um, that was how I accidentally went into the classical world. And I think it was never, 
you know, it was never a thing, but I was told that I had to do that, you know, to, to go into like whatever I wanted to, to do. But yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to classical music, like they wanted you to play it as it was written without any changes. It, it was, did that just feel restricting the entire time you were doing it? I think so. Like it was kind of stressful also because that's just not how, I mean, that's just not how I could do it. I think like I was, no, I, I think like deeply rooted in me because I've been listening to Vanessa May stuff and like all the crossover artist stuff for the longest time. Even that um, crossover string quartet, Bond, B-O-N-D, I've been listening to their stuff since I was like seven, you know? So I think it was really rooted in me to not follow um, a sheet music score or like how classical musicians would interpret it, but just kind of like with beats and stuff like that. When I When I play scales, like I do better with the metronome because to me that was like an that was like a beat <laughs> and I could follow yeah. the beat. So yeah, it did. Yeah. Uh, how do you, so how long did you do classical training for? Oh, I think for the longest time it was since I was five. Okay. In, in Asia, I think like in most parts of Asia, but Malaysia, definitely you would need to like go through a series of graded um, classical music examinations. And that was kind of like the only option there is. There are a few examination boards to it. And I got sent to like the most difficult one. And immediately that was kind of like the goal in music. It's not, well, at least in my observations in Malaysia, it's just kind of like the goal of sending somebody to music. It's always about getting the distinction in the results in the exams or it was for a competition <laughs> you know it wasn't yeah. for do you like playing music like is this what you want to do for leisure or whatever it is so um i had to start off with classical and i think at five it was already imprinted in my mind like this is the goal um, this is so that next year you could go for the great one and then, you know, you could try your best to, to get the, the high score or something like that. Um, so then like being really young, exposed to that, but like since five years old, like I got to learn a lot of classical techniques, classical pieces. And yeah, it was just classical the whole way, but I was really thankful because I had a teacher that loved pop music a lot mm. and i remember her teaching me like other stuff like besides the the pieces in the exams and then when it came to that i felt something like i knew i felt something like when i was really young like i wanted this like this is the, the stuff that i wanted like i don't want to do those pieces and like scales and arpeggios and stuff like that although i know like it's really important um but you know like a, a mixture of it and yeah. uh, that was more of my goal at the end rather than like practicing for the exams. Um, so yeah, I started classical training and I think because of this for many years, that was like from grade one all the way till grade eight. I remember completing my grade eight when I was about 13 years old. And then by 15, there was like a diploma grade and I completed that when I was 15. And I just have all of this repertoire in my hands already, like all of those Bach, Brahms, Chopin, Etudes, uh, Debussy, and all of those. And it's like, that's just what I knew how to play. So that was when I was like, okay, I'm 15. Like, this is it. Like, I don't want this to be it. Like, this is not what I wanted. And so like, I experimented with crossover stuff. And I uploaded my first crossover remix of Coldplay stuff. I love Coldplay, by the way. So yeah, I remember like making my first crossover piano cover of Coldplay's Viva La Vida. I think that was that was like the the hit point for Viva La Vida. Yeah. And then I uploaded my first YouTube video when I was 15 years old. And I was like, okay, 10 views, whatever. But like that felt like gratifying. And like, it's so, it's so amazing to me that I kept wanting to do it and do it and do it and do it. So I think, yeah, I've, I've done the classical training for the longest time, but at the side, you know, these little projects that really made me 
um, complete and whole and felt like my passion was, you know, it was really something worth pursuing at the end. When it comes to like, you liked the crossover, but you obviously had some experience with classical music that you benefited from. At what point did you feel like, I'm sure you're grateful for having some of that classical training. Um, mm -hmm. So like, mm -hmm. let's say somebody was like, oh, I want to make music like yours. Would you say like, we'll learn some classical music first and then learn to do crossover? Or would you say just learn the crossover from the beginning? Like, which, what would you rather have done if you could go back? Would you still do classical at first? I like um, the fact that I had classical training for sure. Uh, it definitely makes practicing easier or not even practicing. I could go to a show, say, tonight or tomorrow without even practicing, just from classical playing techniques. Um, but if there was something I would need to change, it would be learning these classical techniques till it's enough. Like, it's good enough to do what you want to do if you want to do crossover music um, until it's good enough for that. And that's it. Spend more time and focus on that that crossover uh, stuff that you want to do. You know, actually, I was thinking about this question, which is a really good question. Like, what will you change when if you were like still younger? And um, how would it contribute to the outcome right now? Um, and I was thinking about education systems. Deep. We're like going really deep into this rabbit hole, but I think it is a really good topic. So I, you know, I think like majority of people, they get sent to a school, right? Like from the morning. And for me, I got sent to a private school. So it would be like eight hours being in school, like from the morning all the way till like four in the afternoon or something. And sometimes we would have like sports or other, other activities until it was like an hour later. So we would go home at like five or six sometimes, um, at times like seven, if we had like school projects. And this was like five days a week. And that was like four weeks a month, you know, and, um, I was just thinking the same concept, like the concept of home tutoring, where it's like you learn until it's enough. And it's mm. like, okay, if you need to, if you need to get like good grades in science, math and stuff like that, I don't know, like two hours of math a day or two hours of math, like each week or five hours of science, like, okay, wh whatever it is, um, I don't know, but whatever it is to be enough, and then I was thinking if I could go back and change that, the same with the, the classical piano playing, maybe just focusing an hour or two hours to get that scales or technical issue right and out of the way, because it's, you know, quality over quantity. That's, that's the whole idea um, I had. And so if I were to reverse everything, I was thinking I would have so much time in the world as a child say nine years old or 10 years old to go learn DAW. How does an Ableton work out? You know, like how does a microphone work out? I think, cause I, I honestly think like when you're nine or 10, you're capable enough to figure that out. Like everything's on the yeah. internet or you could go to classes like online Ableton classes or online music production classes as like a nine year old and 10 year old and produce your own stuff. And imagine like releasing your stuff at that young age, or it's not even about, the success, but kind of figuring your sound out, like from a young age, that saves so much time. And then like when you're 16 or 17 and old enough, and then, you know, people start looking at you and like, you know, paying attention to what you're releasing out there and you're getting traction. Then that's when you start going on tour at a young age um, with people, of course, you know, yeah. um, not alone, but you know, the, the right people, the right team that you, you will have to guide you and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny that you mentioned uh, being a child working in a DAW. There's this, I can't remember what the kid's name. I think he's on Instagram. My girlfriend showed me a video of him. He's like this little kid and he's like, he's got a little sister and he, he'll he hear a sound and he'll just like want to make a song out of yeah. it. Like there's like a, his toothbrush has like a little thing that yeah, makes yeah, it. Yeah. 
sick. I, and he I like pulled it. it off. Yeah, and he records it. And it's like, this is actually pretty good. Like for a yeah. little kid making music, that's amazing. Makes me exactly. want to give up sometimes. Because I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm 30 and he's better than me. <laughs> but, you yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. And yeah. Well, and it's funny that you you mentioned that you know, you were just told that you were supposed to do it, not be like, not, it wasn't so much about you having an interest in it. I'm yeah. a big fan of when it comes to any education, you should, you should inspire the child or the person learning to want to learn more so than like, you have to learn this and this and this, like you yeah. want them to want to, you want to motivate children to actually want to learn. There's like, yeah. For sure. there's the Suzuki me method that started yeah. in japan and that's like half of what they do is they like the mother learns how to play and then like we'll play around the child and they won't even let the child i this i think this is mostly violin but mm -hmm. they won't even mm -hmm. let the child touch the violin at first like they want the child to like want like crave to touch the mm -hmm. violin and start playing it and i think that's such a cool way of teaching to just inspire people yeah, yeah, I heard about the Suzuki method. And actually this 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 was like a really interesting thing I thought about because I I got to teach two sides. Um for example, here here in Malaysia, I used to teach students like when I was younger after schooling, and I realized a lot of them a lot of them don't want to go through those pages. You, you know, like those pages in the books where it's like, oh, it's singing time or like, oh, it's composing time. Let's spend like the whole lesson on composing. Like it doesn't work that way here. And I think, yeah, it's it's depending on the education system and, and the culture of things. And then when I started teaching in, you know, other countries and stuff like that, like other Western countries where they're a little bit more open to trying these out like these pages like okay um ear training for one hour it doesn't matter um composing yeah. or like learning from stuff like that like yeah i think that makes a kid want to learn how to compose or like want to just do ear training and work really hard in identifying what's a do what's a me what's a so kind of thing yeah yeah it's really different i think I think education systems are really important, like what, like what you said, because, you know, I got to experience like both sides of it. So I knew like um, if, for example, this sort of education system where it's focused on, you know, just the results, just the results, just the results, especially for kids at a really young age. And then like the other education system where it's a little bit more based off what do you really like? What are your interests? How can we use your interests to improve where you're at or like, you know, help you in your weaknesses and stuff like that? Yeah, I think it plays like a big role. Yeah, we th we threw the word "da" out a few times. So "da" is digital audio workstation. I, you're one of the first musicians I've interviewed, so not oh. everyone has heard that word. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, it's interesting too because for me personally, I like electronic music. Uh, I've always liked music, but I I started hearing electronic music, and I'm like, oh, I would love to try to make this someday. And when I first started learning about it, I was in my late 20s and I had a DJ friend and he's like, well, do you want to produce or do you want to DJ? And I'm like, I don't even really know the difference, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, he he originally like started sending me some stuff for DJing and I'm like, yeah, this isn't really what I mean. Uh, it was like actual creation, actual writing the music that I was interested in. So I started in Fruity Loops and then... Uh, mm -hmm. moved over to Ableton and I'm not like a great producer by any means you're much more talented than me but uh, I started learning piano because of the DAW I, I started right. learning piano because it would make writing music in Ableton easier so I think the two are connected more than more than just being an after thought you know mm-hmm Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think a lot of musicians that I work with, 
would also be like, oh my god, like I have to arrange this whole thing or produce a string orchestra based off like an instrument I never learned before because it's like the MIDI keyboard that they have to work yeah. with. And then they're always like, can you just come over and like help me lay out like a, a string orchestra part because this is like. <laughs> and then, um, you know, like when you have a doll, you could actually roll out the MIDI score and then plot your, your notes from there. So instead yeah. of using the MIDI keyboard, most of the time they're just going to like, you know, plot out the notes there instead and forget about the um, MIDI keyboard. And most probably they just use those MIDI, like the small MIDI keyboards for programming drums. That's like 90% of the time, like if they, they've never learned any piano or um, any basics about this instrument. And right now there are actually plugins that are really helpful. They just come out with the arpeggios, chords or whatever that you want. And all you have to do is like just press a note on the MIDI keyboard and then the bass lines and all of the triads, um, the sevenths or the ninths would like automatically come out as an option. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I mean with I don't think I would make music if it weren't for the technology. I would still be interested in learning piano, but I mm -hmm. wouldn't have actually like produced a song had it not been for the ease of access that like a computer allows. And right. I just like I think it's mind blowing that somebody I mean you can go into a studio in the seventies and you'd be looking at a million dollars worth of equipment. And now yeah. you can get that million dollars worth of equipment in a in a one thousand dollar computer, which is insane. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And like so, off of I don't know, digital downloads is like a and it's a instant thing also. As soon as you download it and like um yeah. install it and like, okay, it's done, it's here. <laughs> yeah. Um as far as so you mentioned like writing MIDI. Do you ever write MIDI? Like do you, as a Pian pianist like do you ever just write instead of playing yeah um i arrange accompaniments for clients too like they're clients who just want to record stuff and need a piano so yeah. uh, they would ask me to either record a midi track so they could use their own sound or whatever it is um if loops also like piano loops and stuff like that or um if they just want these uh, wave files, like uh, just piano, like solid piano for movies or trailers or videos and stuff like that, then yeah, I do those like arranging and composing too for them. Do you feel like uh, your writing style is different when you're playing versus when you're you're just drawing MIDI? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean. If it's just my own art, like I could go all out, you know, like just like change time signatures and stuff like that <laughs> or do yeah. whatever I feel I want to do. Um, and most of the time, these compositions aren't planned out. Like I don't I don't wake up in the morning and think of making a time changing song like I'm going to make a time changing song today. Like it just happens like I would be in a composing session or just like a writing session and they'll be like okay what am I going to do today and then it always ends up you know just creating something like that nah <laughs> so yeah it just like happens yeah it's interesting having that da available to you that that studio at your fingertips too because you you can make something on the fly whereas I think traditionally you know when I think of like composers like Bach and Mozart, um, they had something in their head and they wrote it out, you know, so they're writing yeah. what's out. And then I think of like electronic musicians like Dead Mouse and like what you're talking about. It's like, well, it's it's whatever happens in the studio. It's not necessarily that there's an idea beforehand. It's like what comes in the moment and what gets created. Yeah. So you don't you typically don't have something in your head playing. I do have or do something you sometimes. Yeah, I guess it depends. Um, I have like the initial idea in my head. That's where I just start laying it down. Like I would start laying the first track, and then the instant I started doing that, most of the time, 
then I would slowly get into the hang of it. Like, okay, I think I know what this track's going to be or what this track is telling me now, you know? Um, some of them weren't planned. Like, honestly, some sections after the first break or stuff like that. They just happen as I'm recording. And I initially, like, for, say, for example, I would record just eight measures. And then I would sometimes just go on and on. And I'm like, I'll, I'll just let whatever uh, I want to do come out and I'll just record it and that's fine. And then I'll be like, oh, okay, this shit's good. I'm going to keep it. And this is going to be the song, you know? And I remember like recording a song in just a day, like just the framework of it, like the demo, I would say like the first demo um, in a day, because I usually just let the ideas, flow. I don't stop it at all. So yeah. 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 So you talked about uh, time signature changes a bit and you have time signature changes in your most recent song changes and in the song that I first heard of yours shifted, um, <laughs> which, which had a lot of success. Like, and I have, so shifted the, the beginning is do, 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 I probably not doing like. You did a good job. <laughs> I think it was a good but, job. Yeah. <laughs> um, where is the time signature changing in that intro? Because I actually had my piano teacher listen and, and it's really hard to tell. And I'm like, I would actually need to go into an Ableton session to be able to tell. Right. Um, I don't know if you actually have the time because I would imagine you could just have a freestyle recording with the time change, time signature change without representing that in Ableton. So it kind of depends how you create it. Right. Um, so, yeah, it definitely changes everywhere. Like like I, I was mentioning, it changes every single bar, like after each measure. Um, probably the only time it doesn't change um, is in the breaks, like uh, where you have that, that swing 6-8 thing going on. Um, yeah. That's the only section like, I did on, like, on purpose to, to just leave it so that our human ears could rest from it. Whatever yeah. that could be too good. Like, for example, uh, Shift It, no doubt. It's like a really good composition of time signatures, riffs, melodic sequence, and intervals. Yes, that's like, okay, like this is really good and it's really going somewhere. But too much of a good thing is also not good, if that makes sense. Yeah. I like to think of it that way. So just before they start getting bored of something really good or you know some something good or interesting or different from their ear that's where i did on purpose you know those six eight swing breaks in between um but other than that yeah it goes back to changing time signatures and i also did that on purpose just before the breaks where they're still changing time signatures it goes from a pattern like if if you could um tell it goes from a pattern of changes, like it's the same changes after each measure, but there's a yeah. pattern to it. And then as soon as they get the pattern, I'm going to switch another pattern. So it was like a B pattern to it. And that was like another series of different changes, like a different time signature pattern. And then after that, the break. So it's all about how you can balance um, different time signatures according to what would be acceptable to the human ear and still comfortable. And it's all about conditioning the human ear to adapt to, to these changes. Because if you were to throw out a full blown, like I'm going to change times every single measure, for example, and it's different all the way, the ears are just going to be like, what am I listening to? So I'm always, always thinking about like, how can we still make this okay for those that don't listen to progressive music that much or those who have never listened to time signature uh, changing music. Because if you realize, I would say even like 50, it's not like 90% of them are into progressive rock that listen to my music. Like these people listen to commercial music all the time too, uh, like pop music or 4-4 music. And most of the time, 4-4 music. That's why a yeah. lot of them say, even it's changing time signatures, I don't, I couldn't tell like it was changing time signatures. Like it was still like a 4-4 four, four beat to me, like, I don't know what this is, but I like it, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that's my that's my intention, and that was my goal at the end of the day. 
And I, I think I'm happy because, yeah, it's, it seems like it worked. <laughs> so yeah. like the two sides, um, the geeky ones, which are people like me, you know, like, oh my God, like I, I could sense this pattern. Like they could, they could tell the pattern immediately. And then the other um, spectrum, which are like, oh, this just sounds good. Oh, it changes. To, I don't know what that is, but I'm just keep listening. So that was my goal at the end of the day. And I think, yeah, um, my goal is to always, actually at the end of the day, my goal is to always bring joy, make people happy from each release, like each show that I put out and stuff like that. So yeah, this was the main goal, but you are right there. Um, it is difficult to tell because maybe if you aren't so used to listening to time-changing songs, this is why. I was making it on purpose, like an easier way for the human ears that aren't so, you know, um, used to listening to these kinds of music. Yeah. Well, and I, I actually really love the break in the song. I think it's, it's, uh, it just has a beautiful sound to it. And hopefully this word isn't offensive because it shouldn't be, but the beginning is kind of unsettling. Like it's like, <laughs> And that's what music is, right? Music is like tension and release. So yeah. it's like, if there's tension there, it's like, what and is this? And it, like, it almost makes you tense up. And then the break <laughs> comes in and it's like, oh, like, yeah. but it's, it's funny because the break itself, if you had just had that as a song, mm -hmm. I don't think it would, have, would be nearly as successful because it, it's not like there's something just catchy about mm -hmm. the song like it's just it's just so unique that it's like you can't when shifted comes up like for your first time hearing it maybe some people can just not listen to it but it's one of those things where it's like what is this and like you have to stop and listen to it like you can't not i don't think and then when you hear the whole thing it's it gives that balance to it where you have that just release and that yeah that release of tension i think right so, right yeah, yeah yeah it's it's actually interesting to hear <laughs> to hear what you think about it um i mean i've never spoken to you know like uh somebody's real opinion or you know their genuine feedback of like, in in this detail i would say <laughs> yeah in this detail about shifted so it's nice to hear i do um these interviews on omei tv uh because omei omigo got taken down or something i think yeah, yeah so yeah i was like figuring out which platform i should use just for the the video making so i went to omei tv and yeah that was the whole idea like just getting people to play on their phones um shifted and um yeah i mean it's always like a fast like oh my god what is this like this shit's good oh my god i'm gonna follow you know yeah. but never nothing like this detail so that was really nice to hear <laughs> <laughs> i think i saw one of those videos where you had people play it and it was really cool because they were like what is what is this? oh this is cool you know? <laughs> yeah, it's it really was really cool difficult that. for me because oh my god like i don't know how people do it because you know how like on Omei TV, you have like tons of different users behind the screen. It was really yeah. weird. Like, I think, I think people look at the front and go like, oh, this is so cool. Like this interview is so cool. Just like how I see like other creators do it. But then like the amount of conversations you have to filter out, it's like, it's insane, you know? And like the amount of people that skip you, <laughs> I had like, oh. I, I had um, instances where it was really, it was really cool. Like, um, people were in the car or they were at work and they were like, you know, with their friends and stuff and their coworkers and they're like, oh, this is cool. Okay. Let's all stream it. You know, like, like five people streaming it. And then suddenly like just one guy started skipping me and I'm like, no, like I was recording this thing. This was going to be my first successful one for Instagram or TikTok. So it's yeah. so difficult. Like, I think I spent I spent three hours for those like five five successful conversations. It was really oh, tough. Yeah. It was really crazy. <laughs> but it's cool to watch. It's cool to watch. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I I'm familiar with like Omigo from uh 
there's a rapper, Harry Mack, that would record and he'd uh he'd just start rapping about whatever he sees in the room. And I was like, Oh, that's pretty cool. I wonder how many like I wonder how many conversations he had to go through to get to the people that would actually like sit there with him though. Yeah. So, yeah, it's cool. Um what did you what did you find different with changes? Like I, I really like changes too. Um with that song. Was there anything different between that? And obviously they're completely different songs, but what was your approach to that? Mm, okay. I think it's the same, um, the same thing as the process that I was telling you about. And this was exactly what Changes did. I was, I was just playing with a few bass notes on the piano as a riff to start out. And I'm like, okay, this is going really hard progressive stuff, I think. Because it's cool to be like, da, 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 da. And I have to like, I was like, okay, the drums need to come in right after this. Like, there's no slow build. It's just like, bam, bam, <laughs> you know, that kind yeah. of thing. Um, and then I just built from there. And it wasn't like, okay, how do I make this different from shifted? How do I, no. It's just kind of like, boom, 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 okay, let's do it. And then it's like, oh, this is another time changing song. And then initially I was like, shit, like this can't happen because like I made a time changing song already on Shifted. And then in my mind, I'm thinking, like, okay, what am I going to do for marketing now? Because this cannot work like Shifted, you know? And then I was like, what if I changed other things, like a, a series of moving keys halfway through, which, which I did, which like in the, in the end of it. Um, wow. And I'm like, okay, yeah, let's do that. So we got keys. We got time, signatures, and what else can I do? The timber of piano sounds. So I'm like, okay, yeah, let's do it. So I also decided to, um, what you call it? Oh my God. I, I immediately forget that word. Uh, automate. Yeah. The automation of piano timbers and stuff like that throughout the music, that changes. And then, okay, what else can I change? And I decided to put a break in there also just like shift it but i'm gonna change the break and i'm gonna add like different instruments and then suddenly you hear like a string orchestra at the back yeah. <laughs> so like um, i was like okay if we could do all of this then maybe we should use the word changes you know so that was how it came about it was really it was really random like i i never intentionally wanted to compose this way and it just went on like like, again, like I said, in the process, especially for changes, I just let whatever I felt good flow. And most of the time I was recording the whole other section when it was initially just for the first section. I just let, I just let myself play on the piano and like, just, you know, see what I come up with. Yeah. So yeah, not all of your songs involve uh, time signature changes then, right? Like Lost, I don't believe did. did yeah. It? Yeah. Um. Uh... But I believe like most of them, especially okay. in, especially in the EP 2021 part one and part two, I think, I think that was made on purpose. Like, like I know that one's made on purpose for sure to have like different time signatures in each track or at least one in the whole EP, you know? And then I forgot about that concept. And then I went on producing things that felt great to me in terms of sound wise. And that's why when you heard Lost, it was more of like a spacey reflection, cold kind of piano tone to it. And that was when yeah. I started experimenting with different piano timbers and what was my actual piano timber sound that I wanted to have. And so that was kind of like an experimentation phase. And then combining that, with what I have right now, which I think it's basically a sum of like my entire past, the classical past of things, um, being able to listen to the sound that I want. And then, you know, the time changing stuff that I love doing because there was a phase where I went into jazz after classical. Yeah. Um, so putting all of that together. Yeah, <laughs> basically, because I remember seeing some comments actually a lot of comments on my shifted video and my changes video saying that, isn't this just jazz? Like, oh, she found jazz. 
I mean, these people that, that don't know my, my music before and stuff like that, or where I come from, from music and the different genres that I was exposed to. That's when they could pinpoint, you know, like, oh, there's jazz in her music. Like most yeah. of the time, most of the tracks have jazz because that was my history too with jazz. And I think a lot of the people um, assume, especially from, from Shifted and actually also Changes, that this was like, oh, it was like a Tigran Hamashan thing uh, or Dream Theater, you know, and stuff like that. And especially when it came to the argument, I'm not sure if you were aware of it, but it was a really big thing. Um, there were like online debates on Reddit mm. and it's like a, a long thread and also on YouTube on the comments and stuff where people would write essays about analyzing the, the different times in Shifted and time changing yeah. stuff Shifted. And then it, it's crazy because a lot of them didn't know who I was actually influenced by especially when writing the the shifted score and there was just this one guy um this one I, I forgot his username but just this one person that analyzed it perfectly and knew it's like he, he knew exactly what i wanted so a lot of people yeah. didn't know that uh the way i write my scores and the time changes it's actually inspired by dave brubeck he's a mm. really awesome jazz pianist and i was listening to him ever since i was 12 years old and when I analyzed his score, especially the song uh, Blue Rondo a la Turk, it was like exactly what I wanted, the two plus two plus three and whatever I couldn't remember um, in his score. And that was what I wanted to do for Shifted, you know? And mm. I think this one person in the comments got it correct. And he was like, oh, if you were to look at Dave Brubeck, Blue Rondo a la Turk, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That yeah. must be like a surreal feeling. I mean, was this the first song, the shifted? Uh, was that the first song that you've had like talked about to that level? Yeah, I think so. Um, was it, what was that feeling like having like you're you're seeing <laughs> people like just analyze your work <laughs> and, and like in mass like <laughs> like yeah. what does that feel like? Yeah, I remember that for, for Shifted. Um, I was like, it's not that serious, guys. Like, it's just a song. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was like, wow, I don't know why, you know, people would take that amount of time just to analyze or prove their, their point that, oh, it's, it's from this composer or that composer. Um, yeah, I think it's very interesting because, yeah, uh, like you said, this is definitely the first time um, I experienced something like that with Shifted. And then also yeah. people teaching how to count it, like on TikTok and, and stuff like that. They're, they're teaching people how to actually count it. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, it's so interesting. Like, I would never imagine people teaching how to count it. And then... The, the craziest thing is, I don't think I mentioned this yet in public, but I received like a lot of emails from music university students mm -hmm. and music university lecturers uh, because they wanted to analyze my song. <laughs> they wanted to analyze Shift It. Yeah. And then I'm just like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, sure. Like, this is the link to purchase the score. You don't need my permission for anything. Um, you just need to, you know, I guess like because for music universities to analyze the score, you need a permission. I, I don't know. But hmm. for me, it's just like okay. as long as you purchase it, it's fine, I guess. Um, but yeah, so right now there are actually people doing like final year projects from Shifted. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. And then... Um, yeah, and like they they needed a whole like biography or yeah some, something of that sort from the composer. So they were like writing to me on email like, could we know more about you and stuff like that for the project? So it was really cool. And then I I'm not sure which university it is. Um, I think it's like Oklahoma Music University. Mm. Like they wanted to get it for their library, so like Shift is gonna be in their library or something. <laughs> That's cool. That's really Under, like, cool. Like 20th century music. Yeah. Um, uh, with, with the score, 
are you actually like writing the score out afterward or is it something that you're connecting to your DAW to translate it into a, a score? Oh, um, I wish that there was a, there was like a, a better program for that or like an AI that could do that um, as accurately as possible, especially for my music. But right yeah. now I tried doing that once, but yeah, it was all over the place. So I had to like really manually key in the notes onto Muse score, like one by one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still all manual for now. But if anyone listening to the podcast knows or owns a software that could do that, please hit me up. <laughs> I'd imagine it's not far away with where AI is at right now. <laughs> like, yeah. It should yeah, be exactly. possible. So, and, mm -hmm. and we have uh, Ableton, what is it, 11 or 12 coming out here in a couple of weeks, I think. So, uh, oh, interesting. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm sure like, the technology is only going to get better. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when it comes to being able to play an instrument, period, you could have, I mean, you were pushed into piano. It sounds like it wasn't something that you actively chose. And you could have, you could have been pushed into a, str a string instrument or a brass instrument. And none of those translates the way that piano does to composition. Are you like, do you just, are you just happy that it happened to be piano that you learned? Um, I mean, I think, I think any instrument could be produced in the same way that I, I did. I believe so. So it's, I wouldn't say it's just necessarily piano, um, but knowing your instrument and knowing what to do with it and how it could actually help you, you know, in passion and stuff like that. I, I think yeah. it doesn't really make a difference. Yeah, I, I would I would say, you know, I think when I was younger, um, I I wanted to switch to the violin so much because of mm. because of an SMA. And I was like, I can't do that on piano. Like I, I couldn't walk around. But then now I have like the guitar and stuff like that. I walk around yeah. to the audience in my shows that way. Um, but yeah, I think it's finding what you can do with an instrument. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, you can you can definitely like play an instrument in and do creative things with any instrument. But what I mean is like I don't think you can take a trombone. You kind of can. So you can take a trombone and you can play it and then you can translate the the sound to MIDI and then you can use that MIDI but nothing I don't believe translates quite as easily as piano where it's like, oh, I, I can just play any sound with the MIDI keyboard, you know? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Then I would say that would be an advantage, like learning the piano um, and then being able to do the translation on MIDI. Yeah, definitely. I think that was an advantage. Yeah. Where... Where does your creativity come from? Um, do you feel like you were just naturally a creative person or do you feel like it's something that you specifically nurtured or cause like there's people who can play piano and they, they can play other people's stuff, but they can never play like make up something of their own. Um, I think I always wanted to create ever since I was young too. Like when I was, um, like I mentioned, seven years old, and I was like, oh, I don't want to do this exam thing, like this graded exam thing. And I started composing at the side. So like as soon as as soon as my time was up for practicing, I would be like, oh, I want to, you know, stay here more because I need to do my stuff, like what I wanted to do. Like I wanted to create something and compose something. So I think that creativity started from a young age, like and, and the whole exploration that if you put an interval of thirds and thirds apart, you get like maybe a chord that would sound great. You know, like when I was seven years old, yeah. because like nobody taught me that. Um, they're just like, no, you got to learn your skills for the whatever. So I had to like discover that. But I also think it was a great motivation for me because since that's what I wanted to do and nobody taught me, like I wanted to learn it even more till like I could do it. And then from then on, those carry to years later where I started producing my first YouTube video um, and started remixing and stuff like that. 
up till today, I always knew I wanted to create my own originals, even though it was like a crossover of, of a classical piece. That's fine. But then like still, you know, create something of my own. That has always been the goal. So I think because that has always been the goal, it's like it's like definitely you know, a, a must to to create something out of my own. And um, I think because my creativity started at a young age, that was why for me now it's just all about, okay, when do I want to do it? And are we writing now? And then the switch just turns on. Yeah. Do you find creative release in other ways? Like, do you have other creative pursuits that aren't at the caliber of, of your music that you just do for fun? Like, maybe painting or something and they're yeah. like oh it's not something i'm pursuing but it's just something i like doing yeah i think it's actually you're right i actually realize i am a creative person and i need to stay creative and yeah i totally get that because because music which was something i wanted to do is now like my work like my full-time work i then realized like i need to have another outlet for it that's completely different um, so I started painting too. I actually, yeah, I actually painted something, but then like it's in my room. I wanted to show you, but, um, yeah, I started painting a lot. I enjoyed painting a lot. Um, I like making papers also from like nature and I like nature stuff. I like, um, basically creating anything with, with resources around me. I also uh -huh. love like baking. And cooking, like coming out with like my own recipes and stuff like that. Actually, the funny thing was there was like an article that wrote this about me because I, I told them if this music career didn't work out, like I would be a chef. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it's about like the, I think it's about the creativity. Like I need creativity to live for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think creative people, because I think it makes sense why some creative people end up in just nine to five jobs, but I think you need something outside of the job to yeah. give you that release. Otherwise, you just kind of die inside, I think. I think creative yeah. people will die inside if they don't create, so. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> um, When you start getting into something like that, so there's more to music than just making the music. Cause if you just make a song and you release it, it's probably not going to get many plays, um, by itself. You have to like market and you have to yeah. do a lot of things outside of the music. So how do you, how do you go about learning everything else that you need to do? It was tough. <laughs> um, I think ultimately all musicians just want to create, they don't want to yeah. worry about the marketing stuff. But at the end of the day, um, whether or not you choose to believe it, music is still like business. I mean, if you choose to do it like full time, then it has to be a business. Um, and I had to learn for years, how am I going to market a product? In this case, the product is my music. How am I going to market a music video, you know? And I started off with Facebook ads and then like Instagram ads. I did like YouTube ads too. And then I realized this wasn't sustainable, especially for somebody starting out that doesn't have a big label or a big funding backing them up. So now I actually see, I actually see the AI algorithm in Instagram, TikTok. Facebook, um, as a really, really good way of getting to more people out there hmm. and really quickly. So I took advantage of that, um, opportunity and I was like, okay, how does this AI algorithm work? Like, how do they start ranking content and everything? And from then, you know, also watching a ton of tutorials online about how to navigate the algorithm and, and stuff like that. Like it was like tons and endless of scrolling and learning and learning and learning and just learning. Plus, um, the, the stuff that I already knew from marketing and business and PR, um, just adding that together and then yeah, marketing my music this way. Uh, for example, okay. So shifted when shifted came out, um, I think that was like a really high pressure on me because 
I worked with a bunch of amazing drift car racers that were so kind enough to do this video for me. And like, we had a really good drone Hmm. director that had the FPV drones that flew at a really high speed. And it was, it was such an amazing production. And I think like I had a lot of pressure because everyone was expecting results from that. And I, I do know, like, they don't, they don't really, um, you know, put that much pressure like oh um if we do this for you we want this like they they did it for me just because they wanted to do it like there was no expectation of return at all but then i'm like oh this is such a good video this is such a good production like i just want it to work you know and i think it's not just the video like it's this it's the whole song like this is my first like time changing song and blah 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 and then i realized okay here we go like we gotta brainstorm and think and think something that would cause a spark. And that was what I initially wanted to do. Like I wanted to create this whole spark against the community, the music community yeah. on all of the platforms. Like what would cause that spark? And I was like, we have to make a, a strong statement. Um, that is also true, you know? Um, so I was thinking, hey, I was looking at my score and I was like, this actually changes time every measure. And then the breaks doesn't, but that's fine. But we just wanted to to get that general idea of time changing out, like, you know, for my songs. And then, you know, maybe in the next video, we'll explain about the break. So in case people started, you know, accusing of like, no, it doesn't change, blah, blah, blah. Um, (laughs) Then it's fine. So I, without thinking, I just started creating like 20 videos of those. And uh, I, I had no plan, no clue of how I was going to market it, but I just started creating the visuals to it. So like 20 videos and I was sitting down editing and trying to pick out the first one to, to put out, which was the pre-safe and leading towards, you know, the actual thing. And then apparently the pre-safe was the one that got, you know, the, the, the viral point where it was just like me and then you know, pointing at the, I I guess all of that works. Um, yeah, yeah, just pointing at the screen and then, you know, the, the whole visuals to it. And then the strong statement saying it changes after every measure. And then because some people loved it and I think the comments were basically divided into a couple of categories. The ones that are like, Oh my God, like, is that even possible? Like, I don't know music, but it sounds good. Okay. So we have those people. Then we have those people that are the arguers, like that doesn't change, blah, blah, blah. You need those people, honestly. Um, um, if you if you study marketing and stuff like that, you need those people because the more you get them engaged, the more you get them angry and heated in the moment, they're going to comment more and then they're going to get their friends to to argue with them. So that's engagement yeah. and, and another play and maybe another play because they're trying to figure it out like maybe 10 times. So that's another additional 10 views already. And then from then you're going to pull the algorithm and tell the algorithm that, Hey, people actually play this for 10 times. And like, maybe not just one person, but 10 people. So I'm going to put this out more and that's where it goes. And it cycles and it goes up to 3 million, you know, in just like, I don't know, a week or something. So I think that's the, the potential of marketing and understanding the algorithm and stuff like that. You just have to balance it well, for example, in, what I did in that case. Yeah, it's really interesting that you touch on like kind of having to accept and even wanting a little like controversy in your comments and stuff like that because it's something I'm I generally like when people like me. And uh <laughs> like I'll I'll touch on like controversial things. Like I don't think this interview is controversial at all. But I'll touch on, on things that are political and stuff like that. And I just love having deep conversations. And mm. like, I want to, there's part of me that wants to make everybody happy, but there's also a part of me that's like learning to accept, like, no, it's actually good if people argue a little bit about certain things yeah. and, and uh, disagree with you and, and yeah, have some hate thrown your way. Although I, <laughs> some people can get too toxic and those people I just, I typically won't engage with. I'm like, I'll let somebody else engage with that person. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think haters are going to come, especially when you know you're doing something right or something's working out. So I I knew that from the start, like 
if my video is going to go viral, like for sure, I mean, like they're, they're going to be haters. Um, although I didn't know, like it would be this intense about, yeah. about just time signatures, but yeah. And also, especially with the latest video, um, for changes, that was when we experimented with going forwards to the future and seeing, because it's all about changes, you know what I mean? And like yeah. seeing what, what there is for us. And so we came up with the first AI video that we've ever released, like AI music video of a cartoon version of myself and explaining my life, my story and stuff like that. In the hopes of like inspiring others and telling them like, you're okay with where you are right now. Like life is all about changing. And then because of the changes that happens in my story, you know, I'm where I am today. And then, you know, there are a bunch of people in the comments saying like, oh, you're supporting theft and okay. You know, like, I don't know how, how they, yeah, yeah. Because like, because AI steals from people. I don't know. Um, Oh, gotcha, gotcha. And then indirectly to the artist, like, you are a thief. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) So (laughs) there are a bunch of um, comments like that, but um, it's inevitable. I think when you're doing something that you want to do and it's taking off, you're going to piss off some people, you know? Um. And not everyone's going to be happy, but it's all about finding your tribe from that, I guess, like from a, a, a marketing plan going well, going viral. That's where you kind of filter out like who's vibing with you and like who doesn't vibe yeah. out, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What did you, uh, what AI did you use for your making your video? We use Moon AI, which is based off like a, a prompt that you sent on a Discord channel. And then you have selections, like all sorts of selections to choose from. It's crazy. Like you could even choose the camera angles of it. Mm. Um, Like if you want to pan out, pan down, if you want like an FPV drone. So that's why some of those like running scenes and those dancers in the jungle that you see, um, those are all like from from my comments, like I want a drone shot, like from the top, like, you know, like all of those. It's so cool. And um, you could choose between two versions of the model. Like there's a version one and a version two. It's really cool. And it's amazing to see how many people are also using it in their projects and stuff because it's a shared channel um, where you just enter your prompts and stuff like that. And then I would say every split second, there would be somebody generating something. And then from what you see being generated, you kind of get inspired too. Like, oh, that's a cool angle. Like what angle did this person use? Or like mm. which version? Did... It's so amazing. It's called Moon, like, like you know, Moon um, yeah. and then AI. That's it. That's it. It's so cool. Are you are you uploading a, like an image of yourself for it to reference, or are you just kind of describing yourself? To yeah, create the I, model? I just started describing myself. I'm like, I'm okay. an Asian girl. I'm playing piano. I want to wear white. I have like long hair and bangs. Show me what you got. And then like I got that, and it was like so cool. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it is. I'll have to check out Moon AI. I've used uh, Mid Journey a bit just for creating images. And uh, you can probably do the same thing with Moon AI is you can probably, if it's using a bot, which I imagine it is, you can put yeah. the bot in a different server. So like for Mid Journey, I don't create on their server anymore. I just I take it okay. to my own server. So, oh, but okay. yeah, That's- AI is interesting. Yeah, but I think we, um, when we, you know, got everything ready, it was in January this year. So that was when we we did the whole Moon AI production with the music video. And then just after the week where we completed everything and we submitted it for release and our distributors and stuff like that, then they started announcing, I think ChatGPT's um, developers, they started um, announcing Sora. AI, yeah. which is which was basically what we were looking for all this time because we love Chat GPT so much. Um, in fact, we use Chat GPT for our daily administrative task and research and stuff like that. It has helped so much. Um, and then now they came out with Sora, and we're like, okay, we're we're done with the music video. And then Sora came out, which was way easier, like you know, um, because from Moon AI it generates these like five second to seven second videos yeah. that you would have to filter out, download, and it takes some time. Like it, sometimes it takes ten minutes for it to generate one, so we'd have to download it and edit it, and yeah, yeah, 
it's still it's still involving like manual work to it. But um, I think Sora AI has more capabilities in a sense of like, oh, how long do you want the video to be? Like, what kind of yeah. transitions? Yeah, it has more. But it's okay. I, I actually still look forward to try out um, Sora AI probably for like cover art, so like the the next music video or something like that. Yeah, you haven't gotten access to it already, right? Yeah, we haven't tried it, but I um, oh you have I got oh article awesome. about it. Yeah, the Sora AI, but I read articles and yeah, it was really good. I I think it's a really capable AI that could generate videos quicker than any other AI. Um, but yeah, it's cool. It's yeah, still cool. I mean. Only some people have gotten access so far. So there's like, everybody's waiting. Everybody's waiting oh, okay. to get access to it. So that's cool that you've already been able to use it though. Yeah. But, um, but then I think also um, chat DPT, I'm not sure if you've heard of it too. Um, oh yeah. Chat DPT 5 could come out. And then that's like, <laughs> it has even the capability to do an, um, what you call it, an instant translation or something. Mm, where nice, it's just the nice. two and then it, it also translates back in voice and stuff it's so incredible it's amazing <laughs> yeah i mean as an interviewer that's something i'm really interested in and i've been waiting for something like that to come out because i i love hearing different perspectives that's what the podcast is all about and i want to be able to talk to people in different languages but it mm. doesn't make sense to sit there wait a second then get your uh, like you need it to be in real time. Yeah, in real time. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's so, true. Yeah, I'm super excited for that feature. Like, because <laughs> then I could just talk to people, and like, I don't have to worry about what language they talk. Yeah. And and then you can probably have it record your voice and have it recreate it in a in the whatever language, but in your kind of voice too. I would imagine that would be a feature. Right. So, right. Yeah. Um, as far as your workflow, like, how do you break up your writing versus your production? Hmm. I think that writing comes first still for me. Um, I generally tend to lay down the piano tracks first, like just piano only tracks, unless there's something that, um, uh, I need to add in before I move on to the next session or just to get inspired to write the next session, then I would. So yeah, writing definitely comes first and then the production part later on. Probably probably programming the drums. That's gonna yeah. come next because I do play drums myself. So okay. I think programming drums is basically the second most important thing for me for each production, just to kind of lay out the whole it just gives out the whole frame immediately. As soon as you know what kind of hits do you want, what kind of drumming patterns do you want and stuff like that, it changes the whole mood, changes the whole vibe of the of the track, basically. So yeah, I think that's how I basically approach it. Do you do, uh, like when you started, are you using like mostly Ableton plugins or do you have a lot of third-party plugins that yeah. you're using? I think when I started out and I think um, when people listened to the 2021 EP that I did, um, they're listening to a lot of Ableton plugins, um, like like anyone starting out would be. But right now, I think ever since starting out with Lost, that's when I started using a shit ton of like third-party plugins. I love Waves. Um hmm. I also use Isotope. Oh, I love Isotope so much. Like it has helped yeah. in, in my mixes and my my mastering sessions so much too. Um, yeah, a bunch of other. I actually love the BBC Orchestra from Spitfire. Spitfire hmm. is awesome. Um, Spitfire Audio Labs. They have like a bunch of these free stuff too. That's that's really cool. And for my piano, I still love this this same uh, the same piano timber that I got off from Waves at like a promo price. I think it was like $119. Oh, okay. It was like the, the whole full piano pack from Waves. And you could even adjust the microphone as you go. Um, yeah, like there, there are three sets of microphones that you could adjust virtually. And yeah. if you wanted to um, put a mic close to the pedal markings of the piano, 
and it has that sound like the wooden sound of the piano and most of my tracks have a subtle um pedaling sound to it which people may not realize unless like you know they're listening to it on atmos or something and then they could realize oh, okay i could hear that <laughs> the pedaling yeah, sound and it was yeah. done on purpose too so i i love that plugin so much because i have so much flexibility to put in whatever i wanted to do and even the the, the sound of the keys lifting from the piano you have that you know, like that, that wooden yeah. felt, the wooden, the felt sound, that's, that's what sold it to me. Like, oh, I want to put this in my tracks too. Like I want to sound, I wanted it to sound organic without having to worry about, is my piano being tuned today in the studio? Like, oh, what about the temperature and stuff like that? I would say yeah. that's a more traditional approach. Although I wouldn't say like, I wouldn't use it, you know, um, there are still the pros, um, that come with that, that a MIDI cannot produce for sure. And the same thing goes to that. Like there are pros from the MIDI that the traditional way can't produce. Um, so I would say generally I could still use both of them. But what I like yeah. about this plugin is like that, that control that you have, you know, yeah. with these sounds. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so as a someone that's been playing an actual piano for most of your life, can you hear the difference pretty well between the two? Or do you feel like it's hard to tell the difference between the MIDI and the real thing? I feel like right now, um, these plugins are just way too good that it's sometimes it's impossible to tell the difference. And you could mm -hmm. ask like any pianist the same thing. They would also say it's going to be impossible unless, of course, you're going to record from... Um, an out of tune piano in the studio, like, oh, then for sure. Once we yeah. hear something that's slightly out of tune, we know, we know, like for sure, like that's a studio thing and an or organic sound. Um, but yeah, something like the, as far as like the really tuned, like in tune pianos, acoustic pianos and like the MIDI pianos go, like it's almost impossible. And by the way, Alicia Keys, um, she released her own plugin. It's called the Alicia Keys Piano. And it's amazing. It's like, honestly, like if you were to close your eyes and like just listen to it, like, I'm like I don't even know. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's rated one of the best piano plugins out there to yeah. use. So when it comes to like making music and anything creative, there's usually like setbacks and obstacles that you have to face. Like, what do you feel like were the biggest setbacks and obstacles that you faced along your journey trying to make this a business? I think the biggest setback would definitely be the money. Um, I think shifted was the turning point for me, to be honest, because I think for years I have been investing so much in my career and it's never enough. I think if, if you were to understand the whole concept behind being independent and your own label, it's never enough. So I think that was the biggest struggle for me, trying to find the funds to get to, you know, where I want my music career to be at. And then that was when I found out about the changing algorithm and maybe, maybe you don't need to pay for ads. Maybe you just need to be more creative in your organic marketing, you know? And then that's when it took a turn with, with shifted. Actually, struggles are a good thing. Maybe struggles are, are there to, you know, help you change or be a turning point. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we learn from, like, we learn from having things be harder. Like you don't, you don't really grow if you're just coasting. Like you have to grow from that's true. having some crap thrown your way, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> what were the what were the biggest things you learned about the algorithm? I think the biggest things would be I sad to say, but you need to be consistent and almost constant in every video that you put out. It's definitely not like before where things are more like your videos will be shown to 100% of your followers or close to 100% of your followers, you know? 
And because now this algorithm is heavily based on performance in the first five minutes or first hour, um, you have the potential to either make it or break it. But if you make it, it's big. Yeah. So I think that's the biggest thing that the biggest thing also is now your videos are shown to non-followers so you have a yeah. super big advantage there and i think that your videos get determined if it will be shown out a little bit more to other people especially if your non-followers think that you're dope or your video's cool i mean as soon as you can get like in the first five minutes, like a bunch of the almost close to 100% of the non followers liking it or like copy link, share, uh, at story, any of those, like, you know, those, those share button things like that, that affects it a lot. Yeah. As soon as you can get that, like, you know, so in a way, I would say in a way it's easy to navigate around it. Um, but you just gotta keep making things that are constant. It's like, it's the same thing, the same reel, the same background, the same, the same style that you do all the time. And to be yeah. honest with you, like the marketing campaign that we are creating right now, like the next few marketing campaigns, they are based off the same finger pointing video. We're just going to, you know, maybe change the, the message that we want to put out and stuff like that. So yeah, most of the time it's going to have to be around the same thing. And if you realize in the pre-safe videos, that I put out, which was also on purpose. We wanted to keep that finger pointing for after the release, just in case, because during shift it, it worked out during the pre-safe and then everyone's like, it's not out yet. It's not out yet. And then like, <laughs> you know, um, thankfully, thankfully it wasn't far that it went out. But in the previous video where we were promoting the pre-safe of changes, we tried filming a couple of different styles, um, like a, a another finger pointing, but it's like, you know, it's, it's not the, the one that you had for shifted. Um, it didn't perform as well. So it still comes down to consistency, I would say in the content that you make for the algorithm. Yeah. When it comes to making content, how do you balance the need to make things that your audience will share and like, and your vision as an artist, as a creative person, how do you balance maintaining your vision and your originality while also giving your audience what you want, what they want? Um, honestly, I don't know how to answer that question because I am putting out what I want at the end of the day. Um, and I think I'm, I'm really blessed to have that. Because, because I, you know, in terms of the music that I put out, it's definitely something that I want to put out for, for yeah. my own. So that wasn't an issue for me. And to have so many people, you know, resonate and, and love what I want to put out, it's amazing. And I think it's a blessing in its own. Um, as far as the marketing goes, though, um, <laughs> honestly, I, I, I don't know because... Given the choice, I would want to put out something that would have worked years ago, like the professional, you know, the professional camera, the videos, the landscape video and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I, on like vertical videos are the last thing to me that I want to put out, but I don't think it affects me as much. Maybe for other creators, it, it would, but at this point of time, I don't think it's something, you know, so so big that you know it affects my mental health or or anything like that it's just the music and the music video is just one thing that i i would keep as something that i want to put out on my own i i think i made a pact for that um so in any terms in case like i need to i need to confirm to the people out there watching my stuff in marketing okay that part of me can belong to them just yeah. so that they dig the part that belongs wholly to me, which is the music and the music video, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So you just consider those two things completely separate, the actual making of the video, the uh, making of the music and the video, and then the marketing side. Those are just two completely yeah. separate things for you. I think that that's what makes it work for me. Yeah, I, I would not want to, <laughs> I would not want to take the marketing into, you know, the whole brand, the whole vision that I have, but it's just the way it works and you, you just have to do it, you know, at the end of the day to get by. No. So, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you feel like helped you the most with monetizing your art? Because art is one of the hardest things in the world to monetize. Like mm -hmm. it, it's like something that a small percentage of people are able to, and they can do really well. And then there's like the other 99% that are just starving, trying to get by and, yeah. and trying, you know, to get their voices heard. Yeah. Um, initially I, I did try to monetize my stuff. But yeah, I, I, I did get some sales and stuff like that from monetizing, but it's not as much. I think, I think it still comes down to marketing, to be honest, like, because I didn't, honestly, I didn't do much work, um, in monetizing, like once shift that hit that viral turning point, because I felt like as soon as you can get a really good marketing done for a song. Even if it's, it has nothing to do with what you're selling, I wanted to sell my online lessons. I wanted to sell um, my sheet music for Shifted. I wanted to sell merch, you know? And it has nothing to do with a song or marketing for a song, but because of a song, because you're influencing people from a song, then everything takes off. Like, I think I got like 20 people at least a day like every single day, like 20 purchases just from sheet music, like, like, you know, after shift, it got released and I didn't have to do much or spend on any ads yeah. or, or anything. Like, honestly, I didn't do anything. I, I just made a video saying the sheet music is out. The link is in the bio. That's it. So I think the power of marketing your stuff till, you know, you hit the viral turning point. I think that's the, the strongest thing that you would need to do. And Talking about that monetizing, you know, how YouTube has you monetize your music videos and stuff like that, or any videos, right? Yeah. So I just got monetized on YouTube, I would say like two years ago. Um, I'm not, I'm barely like earning anything. I just got like the, the monetizing point. And then as soon as shifted hits, like as soon as that, that video on Instagram turned viral, like it brought, I think now it would be 24,000 people onto the music video. And then like, that's when I received my first paycheck from YouTube. Like, honestly, I didn't do anything at all too. It was just all from that viral turning point video. And then everything started coming in. And then on Spotify and like other streaming revenues, I think Shifted was the first track that brought me like, a, I, I would say a sustainable revenue. And yeah. I think shift that really changed everything. Like, I'm like, okay, so I'm getting this amount of money now. And I was just like sitting there one day, like, should I relax right now? Because I, I think I can, you know? So I think, yeah, I, I think it's all about the, the marketing, and everything. And then now you just realize you just need to keep doing what you want it yourself to do in the first place, just create music. And then things started snowballing in and that's how it should, it should be, you know, like you create people appreciate your art for that. And then you, you start snowballing. Like for example, changes, we just hit our first 10,000 on Spotify already. And then yeah. we're going to hit our first 100,000. It's the same snowball effect as shifted. And then now because of these two, I'm just like also contemplating on my next move for my mental health, like what do I want in life? Because now I just have this big amount of time to also pursue life, like yeah. my, my personal life. Before that, I didn't have time at, at all. It was just about how do I make this work? Because like, this is the only thing I have now, you know? Um, yeah. I'm not gonna go back and, and work in the office, that kind of thing, no. So 
yeah, I I think coming from working hard every day, every day, every hour, like till till the late night. Like how do I how do I make my music work? Until now, it's just like, and then you're just like, okay, I can live now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it sounds sad, but yeah, yeah. But this is this is the reality of what's to come. Like the other side is possible, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I understand it. Like this is this is my creative project, this podcast, and yeah, I'm not mm-hmm. making much money from it yet. But that the goal is to get there, and uh, yeah. I can I can at the currently I can resonate with the. Uh, like that's all it is for me right now. Like yes. it's just constant. Every every waking moment is just dedicated to marketing mm-hmm. my podcast mm-hmm. and making it work. And uh, I know there's an other side that I'll get to eventually, but uh, it's it's a challenge. And I think a lot of people they give up or or they don't see the work that's involved. They don't understand the work that's involved in marketing their art. So they. They give up because they think, well, all I have to do is put my music on Spotify or my, in mm-hmm. my case, my podcast on Spotify and on all the platforms and people will just listen. But mm-hmm. in today's society, it, it's more than that. Like you have to, you have yeah. to do something to get people to say, oh, okay, what is this? Like, let me listen to this. And not everyone's going to like it, but you have to, you have to go and find your people. What, what do you when you were just putting your time into it, what kept you going? Like what kept you, like when it's mostly just a challenge that you're facing, what kept you at it? And like, what did you tell yourself daily when, I mean, I'd imagine you had some feelings of rejection at times when you're like, man, am I going to make it? Or like, oh, I just put out the song and, it's just not performing as well as I would like it to. Like, how do you get through those moments? I think just not wanting to give up. Like, yeah. um, I think that whole mindset of giving up is not an option for me played a really good part. Like, I released Lost and it, it didn't do well. Um, it's such a great song. And I think because I it believe is. in my art. Believing in my own art and knowing that one day, <laughs> like one day, it's not my time yet, but like one day, um, you know, it will work out. So believing in the content that I make, my art, my my music, and knowing that giving up is not an option right now because you're doing fine right now. I know like it's not it's like telling me like, I know it's not the goal, the end goal. Um, which is like living off of these royalties and stuff like that, but you are still doing fine. So that's not an excuse to give up, you know? So I think that was what kept me going. Yeah. For the most part of it, but I would also definitely understand this, this whole thing, um, trying to get your stuff out there. But if there's one thing that I can say from, you know, the, the face of before hitting the viral point and a perspective that I had to change a lot it would be changing the marketing style or whatever you put out there if you want to call it marketing or um what's in it for the people um or what's in it for the people that you would want to attract because then again the marketing is a different thing than what your product is so marketing could be anything and i think the that point of being flexible being flexible to changes and being flexible to do the split between my product and what I am music video visual wise and just the marketing being able to split that was really difficult for me and I would understand as also like a content creator like I want my marketing to look exactly like the product and stuff like that which you know it's a it's a different thing unless you already have like a stream of thousands and ten thousands or hundred thousands of followers and that's a different story but for you know yeah. somebody that's new to the world what's in it for the people and how would they relate to this part of the marketing to go into the actual thing so i think this was something that i learned a lot from that phase being in that phase yeah um 
it's pretty common with musicians to not align with their audience as far as what their favorite song is and what is their audience's favorite song is. Um, Mm -hmm. What is your favorite song? Like if you go and listen to your music that's released, what's Mm -hmm. your favorite song to listen to? And is it the same? I think Shifted is your most popular song at the moment, right? Yeah, it is. So is it Shifted or is it something else for you? Yeah, definitely something else. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think... I think that my my proudest works that I've ever done would be lost and and shifted second. Um, hmm. Also, shattered is a really good one. That yeah, it is still a good one, but of course, the marketing part of it, I was still figuring out the marketing part. Um, who knows? One day I'll figure out how to market shattered and how to market lost again. You know, yeah. uh, after all of these. But yeah, I would say these three, Lost, Shifted, and Shattered. These three are like my favorite ones. Yeah, it's funny because Lost is my favorite song that I've heard of yours. Oh, it's, it's, that's awesome. I love it. I love <laughs> it. It's a fantastic song. It, it has this like, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It has this progressive sound, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, a little bit darker of a sound like a little bit i don't know i don't know how to describe it but i yeah i love it i think it's a great song so awesome awesome that's like um it's amazing because a lot of people are like i love shifted you know like i love toccata and then i'm like yeah thank you you know so i've never really heard a lot of people saying that oh i love lost so much like it's like wow that kind of thing um actually if i were to add one more it would be the August and September from hmm. my 2021 EP. That's like, that's like my favorite too. Like, it's like one of my proudest also. But, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, we love November. We love October. So like everything else except for August and September. And, you know, like um, if you, you can reach a certain point in Spotify where um, they would pitch your music on their discovery campaign. So I remember my first discovery campaign on Spotify. I I unselected every single track in the 2021 EP except for August and September because I want people to like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I selected that. And then it was like, yeah, it's okay. It performed like, okay. And I'm like, you know what? Fine. And <laughs> I selected all of it again, like all of the tracks for the next month. And then the rest of the tracks were performing better. So I'm like, it's yeah. fine. It's fine. <laughs> How do you know when your music is done? Like when, like when I'm trying to create a song, I have a ton of just unfinished music and some that might never, a lot that will never get finished. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm not as talented in the piano part. So for me, it's like I'm focused so much on the actual sound, the sound design and trying to make everything sound perfect that it doesn't end up getting finished. How do you know when the songs that you're making are actually finished um i think for me it's just kind of like i think in the sense of if it's in a songwriting sense of it um i would know as soon as i lay down like the the full track uh on the piano like i would know for sure in terms of like the production side it never finishes, to be honest. Like the okay. production side never finishes. Like, okay, at first you could get like the the arranging part done, which are like, how many more instruments do I want? Like, do I want any more virtual instruments? Do I want any more like FX going on or automation and stuff like that? And today you could tell yourself like, okay, I'm so happy with this. Like, that's it. And then the next morning you're going to listen to it. I'm like, I think I could change this one. I could. It's crazy. Um, so honestly, I don't know yet. If it's in the production sense of things, I don't know how to tell, (laughs) to be honest. And um, I remember releasing changes and then having already released it to the distributors. And this is like a really bad idea. I think, I think for all producers or musicians, like if this applies to you, like if you're somebody like me, as soon as you release it to the distributors, like don't, don't open it anymore. Like don't listen to, to it anymore because 
I was this close to taking it down, like from the distributors, like, and all of these changes would, would not have blown up again. Like I wouldn't have gained another 20,000 followers from the, the changes release video. Uh, but I was so critical because I was editing a video after changes being distributed already. And the release day was like three days away. I was editing a video using my track changes. And then I was like, I don't like this. Like this, yeah. this says something off, but you know, like it could be completely fine to other people, which it seems to be fine and doing very well. But then for me, it's like, no, no. Like, can I take it down? Like, it's really bad for me. Um, so yeah, I honestly don't know where the line is. <laughs> yeah. I have, I don't have any following on like Spotify or anything. I just have my, a couple songs on there because I'm like, well, I'm never going to mess with these songs again, but I did, I did take one song down. I'm like, ah, oh, it's just, I listened to it afterward. I had to take it down, but I don't have a following as, as far as my music production. So I wasn't, you know, losing out on anything anyway, but. Yeah, I mean, I'll listen to something and it's like, oh, the snare is messed up. Oh, the snare doesn't <laughs> yeah. sound good. Or, or it's like, oh, there's too much yeah. reverb there or not enough. Or there's just always something. There's and, always something. And, <laughs> it's funny. It's funny that the production side is what's never finished. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> With your live performance, what is different? I mean, are you... Because you have a production and you have mm -hmm. different parts of a song. Like, what are you doing for your live performance uh, that's different than how you produce? Um, I think definitely playing live is just a different cap to wear on its own because now you're the performer. Like, how can you again, like performing the marketing, but on stage kind of thing, you know, yeah. um, audience engagement, what can you do to make this experience memorable for your audience? Um, how can you make their, their night? How can you make their day and stuff like that? All of those come to my mind whenever planning for a show. And it's like, how can we incorporate something different that would tell them, oh, going to her live show is a different experience. It is a really good experience. So what I usually do is almost all of my songs are a different version of it in a sense of like, they have intros, like one minute intros and they're like visuals to it on the LED screens or whatever it is, like whatever effects we could uh, obtain in the live show set itself, the live show venue. And then, yeah, it just goes from there. I think that's, that's the different part. Although the similarities are, What's in it for, for people? What's in it for them? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where'd you learn how to, as you started needing to actually produce, where did you learn how to do that? Was that YouTube? Did you read manuals or what did you, what resources did you use? Um, on my first album, that was the Grammy considered album, um, Beyond Classical. That was the first album. Um, that shifted my career, I would say, from like the pure classical stuff. And I didn't know anything about the DAW at that time. And I was working with a Grammy producer. And so I just remember seeing and watching and paying for these sessions so I could sit there and watch how this freaking thing works um, in like a, in a good standard being operated by, by, you know, a Grammy producer. And then from then on, like working with him for more than two years and we built like a relationship together. And he taught me just so many things that I had to know, even like navigating the music industry and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I think it started from there. And I think a lot of this started from, from there. Um, although there are many changes and like, you know, I got hold of my own career now and my own, um, creative director and creative manager now. So things are different, but I think the, the most of it started from when I was still working with him and he was producing my album. Hmm. And he was using Ableton and the, the tools that you're using yeah. now? Well, uh, okay. basically everything except MIDI piano. We were still using like the traditional um, piano okay. in the studio at that time. 
So I remember him using Pro Tools for that. So the comping would be way easier um, when it comes to comping those piano um, tracks. And other than that, yeah, it was just all Ableton. And I, I think from there, I got to be a little bit more used to seeing the Ableton interface. And also there's another thing with, um, if I were to, to, you know, like use something else, um, F, I, I mean, I wouldn't be as familiar with the, with FL studio, I would say. And then there's logic, which is yeah. the other, you know, it's like, are you team logic or are you team Ableton? Um, so there's another thing why I don't use logic and it's a funny reason. Um, when I opened Logic's interface, it looks a lot like GarageBand's interface. Not saying hmm. that it's GarageBand. I mean, like just the um, the outlooks of it, the visuals of it. And then remember when I was like producing my first tracks on YouTube when I was like 15 years old, I was using GarageBand. So opening Logic reminded me of that time when I was still starting out and like it didn't work out like with 10 views and stuff like that. So it's a whole like trauma bond situation uh, yeah. with the yeah. logic and garage band. So that's just why I don't use logic. <laughs> um, <funny>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I used FL studio for a moment and it was like, I, I created like a little song that wasn't like produced much. It, there was no mixing or mastering on it. Uh -huh. And Ableton was a lot more intimidating because it was like, it kind of had a bland look. The first time I looked at it, I'm like, oh, this is kind of just bland. But once I learned it for like a month, I'm like, oh, everything just makes sense. Like, it's just very intuitive once you figure it out. Like, oh, you want a reverb? Just drop the reverb on it. Um, but, and then that's before I knew how to use return tracks and stuff. But it's just a lot more intuitive in general. So I think it's, I love Ableton. And mm -hmm. my editor uses Logic, which <laughs> I've watched videos on Logic, but yeah, I, I don't think I would ever switch. Oh, so. okay. Well, Logic is really good. I know it's like a really good DAW. It's just my, yeah. my trauma bonding situation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Um, I always like to ask people that I interview about books. Um, so what are some potentially books or resources that you've really enjoyed over the years that you would recommend to people? Um, I guess my books that I read are more about like my personal life. I don't really think it has anything to do with my music career, but um, I think everyone knows this. Could be a cliche thing, but Rich That Poor That, I think it helped hmm. a lot in understanding marketing, business, and life in general. Like, what do you want to do in life? Like, how do you want to live your rich life kind of thing? And um, another recent book that I was really into a rabbit hole of it was Ramit Sethi, Ramit Sethi's book on like how to how to live your rich life. Um, and I got to know and be further affirmed that it's not about getting a house and stuff like that, you know, because I think um, at the end of the day, a lot of musicians think that, you know, being successful is getting a house, getting married, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so <laughs> it's good to know that everyone has their own rich life and it's okay to have your own definitions of what being successful or being rich is like to you. He also did this Netflix series, which was also really interesting to watch because he goes around um, and helping different people in different stages of their lives figure things out and know that and yeah and actually realize that a lot of people are overspending just because of status issues like um, societal pressure and, and things like that like oh i need to get a house and you know a lot of these kinds of, of things i don't have a house now um no. i don't even know if i want to have a house and honestly another it made me think about another thing in my life um you know how a lot of people are like, oh, if you want to be big or like if you want to show that you are big, if you are official in the music industry or like what whatever industry it is in the entertainment, like you have to make it in Hollywood. You have to be in L.A., which I, I don't think so. 
at the moment, at least. Because, you know, from touring, I travel a lot to different countries. And I have yet to travel to more countries, like more countries in Europe, in uh, Africa, you know, and stuff like that. So I'm I'm just thinking, is life about waking up to a place maybe that you may not want to live, we may not want to necessarily live in, like for example, LA for a lot of people, just in the hopes that it will help you get to where you, you want to be in. But could you have already done that in another country that you, you liked instead or see yourself living in or see yourself enjoying and waking up to every day? So yeah that that's also one one of the things I got to contemplate on like after reading these books and watching these shows because right now you know it's it's a great thing to be able to move to l a and not many people can do that, but having traveled, there are other countries that are my favorite to live in and are are more sustainable and are more safe. <laughs> I think yeah. you know that too um yeah, so. Yeah, I'm I'm in this whole like contemplating zone right now. And I was thinking maybe maybe I'll have just a rental place in LA and um spend the other three months in my favorite country instead, you know? So yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think after especially after COVID, I think I think the options for living away from the the area like LA and and a few yeah. other areas. I think you have more options now because so much can be done without being physically where you need to right. be. So right, yeah. Uh, well, Jolene, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you today. Uh, before we wrap up, why don't you tell listeners where they can find you or where they can find your music, and then anything you want to share about what you have going on coming up. Okay, so you can find me almost everywhere with my artist name. It's Jolene J. Chin. Um, and I think something excited, uh, exciting that I have coming up is my new album. And that's my first full album that's full original um, that's coming out by summer this year. And after, you know, the album comes out, I think the second most exciting thing would be tour. So I'm looking forward to have our first North America tour and um, our first European tour too. So yeah, I think these two things and you know where to find me. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jolene, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been awesome talking to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you for having me again. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to fractalzoo.net where I have unique fractal-inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience, so find me on Twitter or X at RTM Podcast. That's A-R-T-I-E-T-M Podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.